everybody, and welcome to Benevo Bites. We are live. It is Wednesday. It is 4 p.m. UK time. It is whatever the time is, wherever you are in the world, and wherever you are in the world, welcome. It's great to see you people already coming into the show, which is just wonderful to see so many of you with us today. It is, of course, the world's first mobility tech show. Nicola, hi, great to see you. Dana from Connecticut, great to see you. Diane from from the UK, people are coming from all over the world. It's just just great to see you. And, we, and you know how it works, everybody. Write in the comments box, tell us who you are, where you are, what's going on in your world. Just let us know what's absolutely everything that's going on and be sure to ask questions. We're talking about a huge issue today. We're talking about cybersecurity. And cybersecurity, I think, is one of those issues that maybe it hasn't been addressed quite as much as it should be in our industry. I mean, our organizations all tend to be pretty alert to cybersecurity, but how far has it been addressed actually within mobility itself and all the way down to, uh, to the supply chain? I see there Lisa Fontana from Rocket Mortgage. Uh, great to see you, Lisa, and many, many thanks for all your help because uh, you help us get our Sherman H HRCI credits. More on that in a, in a moment. So today we're talking about cybersecurity. Now we talked about cybersecurity uh, two weeks ago, but we want to move the conversation on. Um, what we talked about last time was some of the issues, and we're going to recap that. We're going to recap on some of the issues, but we also want to start talking about some of the solutions and some of the ways that we can go forward. So that's what we're going to be talking about today in, in part two of cybersecurity in the global mobility supply chain. Now, what have, what have we got coming up in future weeks? I mean, we have got some amazing shows. We've got some amazing shows. So on the 2nd of February next week, I'm delighted to say that we've got Maxine Anser. Maxine, Maxine is the uh, Director of talent, Global Talent Mobility and Tax at Carney. Um, and she's going to be talking to us uh, about mobility at Carney, but also... Uh, she is a um, she's originally from Ghana and she moved first of all to the Netherlands and then to the UK, uh, starting at the age of 17. And we're going to be talking about diversity and we're going to be talking about the uh, some of the challenges and the issues uh, facing female, black, African uh, senior level executives. Uh, Maxine is, in fact, uh, the most senior um, black um leader at, at Carney and is very involved with Black at Carney, which is a, uh, a body that they have internally to promote diversity. So we're going to have a really, really interesting session. And I do you know, hugely recommend you all join us on the 2nd of February. And then on the 9th of February, uh, we've got a case study on technology with CGI with David Carmichael. And then in, in fact, the very following day on the 10th of February, we're going to be having a separate session announcing the uh, Benevo cybersecurity solution. That one is corporate only and we're going to, and is a webinar rather than a LinkedIn live show, but we'll be saying more about that in a while. So we've got some huge stuff coming up over the next few weeks uh, and even more planned further out in advance. And I'll be telling you about that nearer to the time, but we've got some really great stuff. Every week, I think you'll know, is we have a breaking news feature. So let's just talk about what's been going on in the wonderful world of global mobility in the last um, in the last seven days. So here we are, and let's just see what's been happening over the last seven days in global mobility.
So many congratulations to everybody whose move had been announced. Um, uh, PwC, great move there um, from, from Jackie. And in fact, I know there's more moves to be announced over the next few weeks from PwC. Exciting times there. Um, all credit to them. Uh, to Ray, who's joined Coinbase, to Kayla, um, who's joined Twitter, and so many, many others. And also many congratulations to uh, ECA and Global Expat Pay on that uh, tie-up. So a lot of really exciting things coming up. Uh, and of course, many of you, I know, do want to get cred credits, CPE credits. So for those of you who want those credits, uh, here they are. If you want your GMS and your CRP credits, the number's there, 16849. Uh, and many thanks to everybody and all our friends at Worldwide ERC for giving us those credits, and also to our friends at Rocket Mortgage for giving us our HCR, HRCI and our SHRM credits. So I'll leave those credits up there just for a moment. Um, so as I said, there's a lot going on. There's been a lot going on, not just in mobility, but in the world, uh, and certainly in the geopolitical sphere has been going on over the last uh, seven days or so, maybe longer. Uh, and so to get into that, uh, I'm delighted once again to bring Julie Onslow Cole to be giving us her immigration update. And we're going to be talking about some of the geopolitical issues that are happening in the world at the moment. So everybody, you know what it's like. Put your hands together. Let's hit the applause button, hit the like button, hit the heart button. And let's say a really good old welcome to Julia Onslow Cole. Hey, Julia, how are you doing? Hi. Very well, thank you, Brian. Good. Always good to see you. Now, I was saying in my introduction that um, we're getting a bit geopolitical. I suppose we're always geopolitical, but um, I know the theme today is going to be a bit around crisis management and what's going on in, in the world. So why don't you launch in and tell us a little bit about, about what's going on in the world of immigration and, and travel at the moment? Yeah, thanks, Brian. And I just wanted to give a big shout out to Cassia Pinska, who's the director of Fragman's European Mobility Solutions, because Cassia um, has been advising a lot of clients um, about the situation in particular in the Ukraine and Russia. Um, but the world is a very volatile place and there's lots of crises uh, going on and not just political, geopolitical crises, but we've seen, for example, the vo volcanic eruption in Tonga and then political instability. And these, these situations put a real spotlight on the global mobility profession. And it's really obviously essential that all companies have a good crisis management plan and moving people is really central to that plan. So I've been involved in, in a lot of crisis situations and um, I led a very big crisis management um, project um, from the mobility side, um, which actually um, was the largest project ever done by a very well-known oil company where we had to take 380 people out of Egypt in the matter of um, hours, really. And um, it was a very interesting project. And that was during the Arab Spring. And then shortly after that, for the same company, I was um, helping with another project where they had um, people on five remote sites across Libya, 190 miles across the Saharan Desert. And we had to um, move them very quickly. And one of the things that I've learned from leading some of these projects from a mobility angle is the importance of knowing who is where. And although that sounds very straightforward, um, in the projects that I've been involved in, often, you know, you have people on remote sites, but they have friends visiting or family, and nobody seems to be aware of that. And so obviously, if there's a crisis, you have to bring out those people as well. And then um, it's been very hard to get um, information about people's immigration history. So obviously that's got to be carefully logged. Now, so if, if there's a place where people are worried, and I suppose 
everyone's thinking about Ukraine at the moment. Are there things that people should be doing now? Yes, uh, definitely. So turning to the Ukraine, Russia. Um, so the thing is that at the moment, um, what we're seeing in the Ukraine obviously is, a, is an evolving situation, but we're seeing that the UK and the US embassy and other embassies are actually pulling out staff so that they've just got a core team. So that obviously impacts visa applications. But first of all, the very first that rule is that it's very important that you uh, tell all your employees to keep in touch with their respective embassies and that they are receiving alerts and uh, recommendations. And um, a company's crisis management plan should have very good details of emergency exit routes by plane or overland, and then have a team dealing with all aspects of communications and physical logistics. And in my experience, what often happens when situations really escalate is that the phones go down and ATM shut. And, um, you know, it is actually very difficult um, to get people visas, for example. So um, it's essential as well, as I said, to have details of the immigration status of all of your employees and whether they have permits to work in any other countries. So obviously, uh, if you're not a national of the country that you are in, you could go home. But is home helpful uh, to strategically carry on your business? So what you're looking at in your planning is where you would take people to and how you could quickly change their status into that of work or move them to a country where it's, it's better for them to work. Now, nationals of um, Ukraine who hold a biometric passport they can travel visa-free to Schengen. And what you're looking for is the ability to travel visa-free because obviously they can then just leave if they, if they, if they need to leave. Um, and they can stay for uh, 90 days uh, within a 180 day period. And, and most people in the Ukraine do have biometric passports, but some might not. And it's still not too late to actually apply for um, a biometric passport. So it's going to become harder and harder, um, but it is important to do that. I'm just reading the comment from Jamie about... Um, I'll just put it back up here. We just yeah. had a few government employees evacuate Abu Dhabi due to drone strikes by Yemen yeah. rebels. It was all yeah. hands on deck and employees evacuated within one day. Yeah, absolutely. So really, that's really good, Jamie, and very good example of crisis management project. Now, um, Supposing uh, you don't have a biometric passport and you're in the Ukraine and you can't get one, then you have to apply for a Schengen visa. You should apply at the country that you're going to in Europe. And with COVID restrictions, it might be a bit challenging and consulates may limit the acceptance of applications only to those with a strong justification of going. But that's what you're looking at to get a Schengen visa. And of course, in, in addition to the visa requirement, you've got all of the COVID restrictions. Now, once you're in the Schengen area, so if you've got a biometric passport, you don't need um, you don't need a Schengen visa, you're visa free. Or if you have a Schengen visa, you can get to the Schengen area. And there are certain countries like Poland and Finland where it's very feasible to switch from visitor to work permit. It might be a bit difficult, but it's feasible. When I did the big project in Egypt, we brought everyone to the UK and then we negotiated with the Irish and the UK government to allow us to take people to Ireland and bring them back to the UK, thereby getting around entry clearance rules. Um, but you've got to see how you can switch people. Now, if, you're, if you've got Russian citizens who you would like to move, um, Russian, Russian citizens have international and national passports. And if you want to travel overseas, then you must have an international passport. And Russian citizens with an international passport can travel visa-free to certain countries like the UAE, Bahrain, Turkey, Serbia, Argentina. So, um, you know, that, that's worth looking into. And then the other thing is that if the situation is so bad, whether you actually can't get a visa, but you need to evacuate. So I'm not necessarily talking about Ukraine or Russia, but say in my case with Egypt, the situation really escalated during the Arab Spring. We were on the phone to the Foreign Office and we were saying, well, we're, we've got a coach. We're trying to take people to the embassy. 
But honestly, I can tell you on the ground, these roads are being blocked. I, it's not safe. We need to take them to the airport. Then what you have to do is you negotiate with the government a visa waiver. So in that case, we negotiated it with the UK immigration minister and he gave us a visa waiver for all of those people who he accepted couldn't get to the embassy to get a visa. And in addition, you need a, uh, a carrier's liability waiver which protects the airlines because they uh, get fined if they have people without visas. So you need these kind of two visas. Okay. So uh, visa waivers. So in summary, just three points. Obviously, really important to have a crisis management plan. It's good in a time when there's no crises to dust it off and do a, a practice. All families, uh, members and employees should have, you know, their, their uh, whereabouts noted uh, immigration history updated and um you know the 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 real thing is to think not just about where you would take people to but how best to keep business continuity and where you want to take them to from that 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 point of destination okay that's really helpful obviously worrying times for uh for many people especially those uh in ukraine at the moment uh and as you also touched upon you know obviously there was uh, a lot of problems out in Tonga too. Uh, but really helpful advice, Julia. So everybody, <clears throat> you know how it works. Hit the heart, hit the like, hit the applause. Let's say a big thank you to Julia Onslow Cole. And what we're going to now do is to bring on our change maker for the week to be talking about um, the charity that she supports and how we're doing good in global mobility. So let's say goodbye to Julia and welcome Carolyn Velovsek, our uh, our change maker for this week. in central Wisconsin. So I see a lot of people are saying, well, you know, hi, it's cold here. Well, it's it's 25 below here. Schools were canceled. So I feel the pain of everyone who's saying it's cold out. So you're going out skiing, are you? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And so your kids are at home with you? They are. So if you see any kids in the background, yes, yeah, schools have been canceled due to weather. So they're they're here. Okay, well, we'll keep our eyes out. Hopefully we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll get them on stage as well. Yeah. We'll, make them, we'll make them world famous in the mm -hmm. world. <laughs> so, Carolyn, first of all, thank you so much for being a change maker. It's great having you on board. So, tell us a bit about um, the company you you work you work for and and your passion for technology. Sure. So, I work for Cox Automotive. Um, I've been there for about a year and. Um, Cox Automotive, really, we are looking to transform the way that the world buys, sells, um, owns, and uses vehicles, right? So it's all things automotive. Um, we have brands such as autotrader.com, Kelly Blue Book, Mannheim Auto Auctions. We have mobile fleet services. So anything that really touches the auto industry, we support. Um, and when Benevo introduced the, the Change Makers Network, network um, you know, I thought it would be a great opportunity to get involved because, you know, I think we're always looking for ways as global mobility professionals to look at technology and how can technology help streamline things and make the process easier and simpler for employees while still maintaining that human touch. And I think, you know, working through the Change Makers, um, you know, really is helping to, to drive more of that technology to Make things easier both right for the program management teams as well as the employees that we're looking to relocate and send on assignment and and then there's that charitable aspect as well yeah and tell us about the the charity i mean it's the aspca so i'm guessing you're i can see a child in the yep. background there's hey. Hi. Hi. she's hiding <laughs> oh 
Hi there. <laughs> and what's your name? That's Olive. Can you say hi? No. <laughs> Olive. Okay, That's shout, Olive, though. Yep. Shout, shout out to, to, to Olive. Yeah. And I gather there's also um, Henry and... And, and, and Henry's around somewhere. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I see him peeking up through the stairs. Yep. So they're both here. Oh, yes. I think everyone can see Henry, Henry too. Mm -hmm. Hey, Henry. So, so tell us, you're obviously an animal lover. Yes. Uh, and I know you've got a rescue dog. Uh, mm -hmm. tell, us, tell us about the ASPCA. Yep. Yeah. So the ASPCA, for those who don't know, is the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. So it's a mouthful. Um, it was established in 1866 as the first humane society Mom. in North America um, and one of the largest in the world. And... No, I, I will talk to you in a second. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> and really, the ASPCA working is all about. Uh, it is. This is you know kind of how everyone is working now. Um, but really, their mission is to provide an effective means for the prevention of cruelty to animals um, throughout the United States. Um, you know, and it kind of as we talk, I've been an animal lover all my life. Growing up, we've had cats, dogs, hamsters, birds, you name it. Um, and there are so many animals out there looking for loving homes. Um, you know, our rescue dog has been my coworker, my stress reliever, right? My companion during throughout COVID when we were working from home and now my job is permanently remote. Um, you know, so he's he's my he's my coworker and my office mate in addition to these guys. Um, you know, and one of the goals of the ASPCA is really to find homes for the animals that don't have them, finding loving homes, but they're also looking to provide a voice to those animals in other ways, such as working with local law enforcement. Um, and federal law enforcement to put together more um, anti-cruelty and, and stronger um, anti-cruelty laws and regulations, um, looking at really regulating puppy mills and shutting those down, um, as well as not only your companion animals, but then looking at farm welfare, um, looking at how farm animals are treated in factory farms and putting together rules and regulations surrounding that to make sure um, that we have laws in place to protect those animals as well. Sure. It's Karen, it's a great charity. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for all the support you give us with the change makers and uh, and all the good work you do with ASPCA. Uh, if anybody else would like to um, to be a change maker, then do contact us uh, and, and let us know, and we'll see whether we can get you on on board with the change makers. Uh, just a couple of comments here coming in um, here from our, our friend Vinny. Hi, Olive and Henry, family on the screen, one of the best things coming out of COVID. So that, that, there we go. And, and from Jamie, uh, ASPCA are angels on earth. Anyway, we're going to move on now. So Julia, um, sorry, uh, Carolyn, absolutely wonderful to have, to have yep. you on, on the show. Um, we're now gonna go into the segment of the show when we're gonna be talking about a cyber security, which is a huge, huge issue. We did talk about this a couple of weeks. Uh, we're going deep, uh, diving into it a bit more. So we'll say goodbye to Carolyn, to Olive, to Henry. We didn't see Chuck the dog, but I know he's out there somewhere. He's, he's uh, laying at my feet right now, okay. <laughs> keeping my feet warm. <laughs> <clears throat> we'll say goodbye to you all and goodbye to a chilly Wisconsin. Yeah. And we're going to move on to talk about the very hot subject of cybersecurity. Say goodbye to my mistake. Oh, we just get another chance to see Olive. Take care. Right, technical error there from the producer. Well, actually, not the producer, from the uh, the man front of stage or, or, with, with the uh, slowest fingers of the day. Anyway, Nitsan, Ryan, great to see you both on stage with me here. Um, now, obviously, we talked about cybersecurity a couple of weeks ago, but for people who missed it, maybe we'll just start off with a bit of a of a recap. So let's just start off with with this, maybe. Nitsan, if you could just kick off and then we'll move on to Ryan, who is our uh, our expert, the CEO of a, of a cybersecurity company, Certus. Um, but what is, what is cybersecurity? 
Yeah, so cybersecurity is, is a big term that covers um, a range of areas that about protecting our, um, uh, protecting from online threats, whether it's going to be uh, viruses or uh, data breaches or other um, social hacking and other issues that can happen online. But basically, we in today's way, world, there are more and more uh, risks and cybersecurity is about how we mitigate those risks, how we manage, how we reduce those risks, and how we protect um, our, our data in the online presence. I think I think you know one of the uh, interesting points we've done on the previous show is we launched a benchmarks study about uh, cybersecurity and specifically cybersecurity within within supply chain and. And what came out um, of that is that we are still running the survey. So anyone uh, here? I'll put, I'll, put, I'll put it up here, Nitsan. So yeah, there's there's a there's a survey out there. If you go to benevocom slash cybersecurity dash survey, and I think we'll put it in the LinkedIn comments as well, which might be easier to click on than trying to remember that that's going across. But that that survey is still open. Um, but tell us how it's been going in terms of the. You know where, where, where we've got to any preliminary findings, level of take up, the sort of thought thinking that's coming out of it. Obviously, it's very, very preliminary at this stage. Yes, uh, we have almost a uh, hundred companies who participated in that, so it starts to be substantial um, data, and and the findings are, are fascinating, both from the corporate and from the vendor point of view. Um, the good news is that both corporate and vendors care a lot about uh, cybersecurity and information security and see that as high priority. Um, that's good. That's on corporates, um, mostly agenda, not only on mobility. Obviously, mobility is important because we hold so much information about individual, but generally that's the, the approach in the company. Um, about 65% of mobility leaders um, say that the, their job security will be in um, significant risk in case of uh, a severe data breach that could result in a fine. So, okay, so sixty-five percent—that's nearly two thirds. So, two out of every three global mobility professionals who responded to the survey said that if there was a breach of data security, their job could be at risk. Yes, a significant, a significant, significant risk. Yeah. Yes. Okay, yes. so that that shows that organisations are not messing around when it comes to cybersecurity. Um, Absolutely. Um, but that's the good news. But the bad news is that the state of, of say, information security is not where it should be. 40% um, of, the, of the corporates reported that they experienced um, a, a data breach due to a supply, one of their suppliers, one of the direct or indirect vendors, which is a large number. Um, it's not very different than the numbers um, in, in other industries, but it's Again, it's it's a big number, and that's a number that uh, needs to be addressed. And that's that's a little bit what we want to do on this show. We want to talk about how we can, as an industry, help each other to upgrade all the areas of cybersecurity to make sure we protect our clients' data better. Okay. Well, let's get into that. We'll delve into that a bit, a bit more, but I just want to bring Ryan into, into the conversation and just tell us a bit about cybersecurity. I know it's not just cybersecurity. People also talk about information security and data privacy. What's the difference? Just give us an idea of, you know, let's just talk about what these terms mean, Ryan. Yeah. Information security, kind of textbook definition. Uh, uh, it, it's a broad topic, as, as Nitsan uh, mentioned, but textbook definition is really... Uh, the protection of information and information systems from uh, unauthorized access, uh, disclosure, usage, with the goal of providing uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability for an organization. So that's that's information security. Data privacy, we're really talking about uh, data subjects, individuals, uh, the protection of confidential information such as PII, um, and uh, that's generally how I would define the two topics. And they're really related. Um, you're, you're going to leverage information security best practices and uh, security measures to ensure uh, privacy of PII, uh, personal identifi identifiable information or, or uh, corporate information. Okay. And Nitsen, let's sort of try and bring this home and bring this into sort of 
the real world. What sort of breaches of security, information security, data privacy could you see, could you envision in a relocation? I think one example that we've learned uh, uh, from, from a contact in the industry was around uh, shipping and household goods. And that's the scenario that, that had to be addressed, right? A senior executive um, in the company that had a surveyor comes to their house, take video, take the photos as the shipping company, and then holding that information alongside all of the employees' PII, uh, so their personal information, for a very long period of time, sometimes even seven years. Um, and that's that means that when that data got breached, because it ended up to be, of course, a small vendor um, who, who delivered that service, it means that a mobility manager had to go to that senior executive and tell them that all their personal information, including the address, including everything that is in their house, is now available on the dark net um, for any hacker and any fraudster who, who want that information. That's obviously a conversation none of us would like to have. Okay. So let's just ask the, the audience that, ask, interestingly, in, in your comments, I mean, I don't know whether people realize this or they've thought about it, but again, so here's the scenario you are moving or someone, one of your suppliers is moving a senior executive, let's just say for sake of argument, it's your CEO. Um, and his or her data, presumably, you know, pictures inside the house and any other personal information uh, is all on some suppliers servers and could be there for say seven years. So if they have a breach, say five years later, um, then all that information is there. And I suppose the obvious question to ask the, the, the audience is, is that something you're alert to? Do you have policies in place to, uh, to restrict how long data can be held by your suppliers? Um, I, I think this whole question of managing that, 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 that data is, is, is important. Um, but I mean, maybe just go back to, to, to Ryan on that and, and go to that issue. I and mean, we've given one example there. There's obviously plenty of other examples to do with a, a move. But why is cybersecurity so important? Why, why is everybody getting so hot under the collar about this? Is it to do with fines or is it reputational damage or is it uh, other issues, hacking, blackmail? I, I don't know. You know what, what are the issues? Why are people so concerned about cybersecurity? Well, I think it's all of the above. And I think that... Um... Uh, cybersecurity is taking on increasing importance for uh, businesses and organizations, particularly in the mobility sector, uh, because people are starting to recognize the consequences of a, a data breach for their business, their business relationships, uh, the, the customer trust, and also the regulatory impacts which might follow. So for all of those, those reasons you, you mentioned, I, I think that um, uh, cybersecurity is taking on increasing importance. And then I think also uh, uh, you know, uh, large corporations have, have recognized the importance of cybersecurity for a long time. Uh, but I think increasingly smaller businesses are recognizing that they're at risk as well and need to take proactive steps in order to improve their cybersecurity. And that includes vendors to large corporations, uh, which could present a security risk to those organizations if they don't have the right security practices in place. Um, so, so uh, you know, so I think the encouraging news is there's uh, increasing focus on the issue, and there's a lot of resources out there for organizations to to uh, leverage as they look to improve their security posture. And Nitsan, I mean, you know, we've talked about fines and reputational damage. Um, I don't know if you can sort of talk a bit more about that, and maybe sort of I don't know if there's examples you can share, or whether you can talk about the sort of levels that we're of fine or reputational damage that we might be talking about here. Yes. Yeah, so there are a number of of consequences for uh, a data breach. One of them is the risk of a potential uh, financial fine that can get to 4% of global revenues um, or, or $20 million, the higher of the two. Um, and, and there have been fines uh, that were uh, applied on that. Um, but it's not just the, the fines, right? It's also the interruption to business as normal. We've asked in our benchmark report, who would you need to um, to communicate to in case of a data breach, and the list is so long, right? There needs to be the business managers, the 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 comms team, 
the legal team, the uh, vendor compliance team, the list is, um, sorry, the affected, of course, employees and their managers up to the head of HR, a lot of in people, and it's, it's a big disruption to business. There is reputation, and, and of course, there is the embarrassment with the employees, right? The employees trusted us to handle their data and protect that, and now we need to tell them, sorry, we failed on doing that. So there are, you know, a number, a, a number here of levels of, that are not of, of a concern, sorry, that are not only the financial uh, fines. So there's a question here that's come in or a comment that's come in from Christian Hall, uh, who I think is with uh, Itron, Itron. Uh, and I'd like to just get your views on that, um, uh, maybe Nitsan first. But he said, this is something we have done a deep dive into at this point. Uh, sorry, this isn't something we've done a deep dive into at this point. We trust our suppliers to comply with local requirements. It would be an interesting topic to discuss with our RMC. Now, my view, before I hand over to uh, to Nitsan, is it's not just something that I would suggest you discuss with your RMC. It's also something your RMC should be discussing with all their suppliers, down to the smallest supplier in the remotest location, and that's one of the one of the issues. Um, but uh, Nitsan, I mean. What do you feel about that from a, a corporate? This isn't something we've done a deep dive into at this point. We trust our suppliers to comply with local requirements. Can we just rely on trust? And what is typically happening at the moment in the industry? Yeah, unfortunately, that's what's happened. We trust, and that's what 40% of corporate report a data breach. It's not enough. It's just not enough. It's it's not the fault of the vendors because, because the requirements have went up and the solutions we have in our industry are still what... Uh, they are outdated. There were process solutions that were good for 10 years ago, but with the new risks and with what's happening, um, uh, more solutions are needed and everyone needs to step up and upgrade their solutions. We, of course, offer one, one type of solution. I'm not going to say it's the only way to do that, uh, but definitely this requires talking um, and what I would recommend to any corporate here is, is to see what other solutions are available on the market and then go to your direct vendors and most important to your indirect vendors and make sure they apply that, whether it's with Beniva or someone else, but just make sure you do something about it and not just say, okay, you know, let it just Absolutely. be. Absolutely. And another comment here from, uh, from Eric Halverson, um, one of our strategy council members and formerly head of mobility at eBay. Hi, Eric. Uh, he said, it's easy for a supplier to claim to have sufficient data security, but how can we really know? And, and I know one of the things is that some of the RMCs out there, we're not in the process of naming names, send out a questionnaire to their supply chains once a year for them to fill out. But the problem is that this is something that needs to be done in real time. I mean, tell, tell me about that, Ryan. I mean, if you're checking cybersecurity, you know, properly, if you like, how often should you be should be you, you be checking it, and is it is it enough just to do an annual survey? Um, annual is probably not enough, or definitely not enough, actually. And it's interesting uh, topic that Kenneth raised around um, trying to understand the security posture of any vendors that you you might be working with, and there's differing approaches uh, uh, that organizations are taking. Some uh, are uh, you know conducting assessments. Uh, some uh, provide, uh, you know, questionnaires and the level of, um, you know, depth that those assessments go to or level of testing that might be involved uh, related to that. It's going to vary depending on the, the kind of criticality of the information that that supplier might be handling, uh, as, as, as well as the risk tolerance of the, the corporate organization. But uh, regardless of that, I think organizations really need to uh, take a, a view of uh, what is their risk tolerance, uh, you know, prioritize those suppliers that they do have in terms of the potential business impact if there were a data breach, and then uh, take a view towards uh, uh, assessing those suppliers and understanding their security posture, and, and that can take different forms. I've got a question for the, for the audience, actually. Um, and this is, a, how many companies allow, or how many suppliers allow people to use personal devices? Uh, for for example, they might be messaging the the, the client, the end client, the, the the assignee using their 
their personal phone or their personal laptop uh, and thereby getting personal information which is outside the corporate system. They may even be taking surveyors, may even be taking photos uh, based on using their, their personal phone or their corporate phone. How common is that? My feeling is that, that that might be, you know, going on a bit and we wouldn't necessarily know about it up at the corporate level. But Ryan, what would be the issues or Nitsen, what would be the issues that you could find if somebody down the supply chain is handling personal information using their private device rather than their corporate device? And why is it so important? I can take a stab at that one first. Uh, let me first say that organizations will have different policies around uh, use of uh, personal devices or bring your own device. Some might provide corporate devices to their uh, workforce. Uh, but regardless of the approach that you take, uh, there need to be defined information security policies, which are then enforced either on those uh, personal devices that might be handling corporate or business information or those uh, you know, em employer provided uh, devices. And the, the risk there it, or, or the reason for that is mainly around understanding your footprint, understanding where uh, you have sensitive information. And if you have uh, unmanaged or uncontrolled private devices with uh, sensitive information of your employees, customers or business, um, there's, there's obviously a risk that it's lost. And um, in that position, when the device is unmanaged without security controls on it, uh, the employer or organization will lack visibility to what happened uh, or, or be able to basically respond to that. Okay, and a couple of other comments that come, have come in. Um, I mean, well, Mike Hibbers made a comment here, taking on, uh, uh, and congratulations on the, the, the deal with ECA. Mike is with Global Expat Pay. Um, so Mike says, it's also surprising how much compensation information is shared via email and Excel. Nitsan, you're, you're nodding your head vehemently. So tell me a bit about, you know, about, about your views on that. Absolutely. Um, I agree with Mike. I'll, as mobility, we hold such important and confidential information. But when it's being shared, we've seen so many times that the default is to share it via email, sending an Excel file, or... Um, or, or any other unsecure method, which is just absolutely shouldn't shouldn't be done. I mean, we can hear from why 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 not to share information like that, um, and and what are the risks? Um, but sure. So, what, what's what's the risk, Ryan, of of sending something by email? Well, I mean, we all use email, but uh, I think the the um, the message to get across is that even when leveraging email. Uh, or any uh, various productivity tools that you're, you're, you might have in your business, it's important to ensure uh, for the organization to ensure that there's appropriate security controls uh, tied to that. So uh, when, when leveraging email, an organization might want to ensure that they have appropriate uh, DLP or data loss prevention controls to detect when an Excel spreadsheet with uh, full of uh, compensation, sensitive comp compensation information is being uh, shared to uh, from a, a corporate email address to, say, for instance, an employee's private email address uh, or, or other use cases which might suggest um, uh, basically the unauthorized disclosure or sharing of information. Uh, and so, so DLP uh, is, is one uh, control that immediately comes to mind, but there's others uh, that organizations need to be considering and Im implementing uh, to protect uh, or, or securely uh, share information and engage with their business partners. Okay, and a comment from Patricia. Patricia is uh, based with K2 out in Brazil. Uh, she says, RMCs have to comply with the same GDPR regulation, ISO audits, internal audits, etc. You should ask to see the results. Also share what you need. So if the RMC doesn't have it, they can provide it. Now, Nitsan, is that enough? I mean, that's that's talking about the RMC, but presumably, we've got, again, we've got to go all the way down the supply chain. But again, is an audit enough or do we need something in real time? Yeah. As, as we discussed before, no, that's not enough. And the RMCs are, are just one step. Many times the problem is with the downstream vendors that the corporate doesn't have direct relationship with, hence doesn't have control on how they handle the information. RMCs don't just hold the information, they pass it down to the 
um, shipping companies, to the ha temp housing provider, to the local DSP, who then pass it down to their provider and their provider, and everyone have access to PII. Okay. Personal now, information is just too much. Now, Nitsana, we talked a little bit about the survey, and and you told us that I think we said you said you we'd had a hundred over a hundred responses already, and I think you said that two thirds of people were concerned that they could uh, risk their job. Uh, if there was a significant data breach in their organization and that 40 percent said that they have had a, a, a data breach. But I think there was also some statistics that you could share possibly about the number of vendors who actually admitted in this anonymous survey that they didn't follow the basics, which is a bit scary. It's not, it's not anonymous, but yes, uh, but we, we, of course, keep the information confidential. Uh, but but what's important um, but, but with regards to what the vendors uh, have shared, which, you know, I appreciate the honesty, but it's, it's, it's a concern that 50% of the companies, to answer your question before, said that they are using um, personal five, devices. Five, five zero, not 15, right. five zero, 50, one half. Half the company, yes, one half of the half. companies. That's extraordinary. Are using, uh, are using the personal devices to contact employees with their personal data, um, which is which is a lot. And I think the other thing that came out of those findings is that the typical corporate who participate in the survey was, was large, right? As we know, our clients are very large companies, while the vendors, the majority of them were small organizations, and especially the downstream vendors who were even, even, even smaller companies. And that's why they, the, the, that's where the, the mismatch is. The requirements of the corporate is to be at the top and they are dependent of every vendor and downstream vendor to keep the same levels. Otherwise, it's it's the weakest link, right? The weakest link that will break the chain. And that's that's some of the challenge that that we need to address as an industry. So maybe let's talk about, about a few a few solutions we can we can apply um, for for people who participate on this call and, and take from there. Absolutely. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about solutions. So tell t tell us about some of the, some of the solutions. I mean, what sort of what can we do to Im improve cybersecurity? Sure, I can take that. I, I think that um, it, there's no one single silver bullet that organizations um, uh, need in order to tackle uh, and improve their 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 cybersecurity posture. It's really a mix of activities that are conducted on a continuous continuous and ongoing basis, uh, which lead to organizations gradually improving their security posture. And I think that that uh, as organizations and, and companies look to do that, the best, uh, best uh, resource to turn to is some of those industry standards, which are widely adopted, um, that, that provide guidance on uh, what organizations should be doing from a vulnerability management, secure software development, data protection, uh, incident response uh, and business continuity. These are some of the, the major uh, areas and components of an effective se security program. And uh, organizations and companies need to understand that um, they're going to need to tackle uh, all of those um, on a continuous and, and, and ongoing basis in order to make meaningful improvements in their security posture and to meet the requirements of their business partners. Okay. Now, some of the phrases that I've heard you using when we're talking um, in our in our green room uh, were things like defense in depth and layered defense. And can you sort of explain what some of these terms are and, and what companies do? Because it was, I must admit, it was all news to me. So I'm, I'm fascinated to, to hear how the experts do it. Sure. So the the concept of defense in depth is essentially that rather than relying on a single security control to protect your company or organization and its its confidential information, uh, businesses need to re rely on a, a range of uh, complementary security controls that uh, protect sensitive information such that if one control fails, there's other controls which are in place in order to protect that information and, and prevent some sort of incident. So uh, that's really the concept of defense in depth. And, um, you know, there's, there's a range of solutions that organizations need to be um, looking at implementing, be it data loss prevention control to uh, protect sensitive information from flowing out outside their, 
their uh, their business, antivirus solutions on their uh, workstations, uh, mobile device management for the you know organizations that ha might have uh, bring your own device or need to manage mobile devices uh, and need to wipe them if there's an incident or loss. Um, all these controls work in concert in order to protect the organization's sensitive information from the various ways in, in, in which it could be lost, exfiltrated, or otherwise compromised. Okay. And is that what we mean by a layered defense or is that? Yes. Layered defenses and, and defense in depth is, is essentially the same concept that rather than relying on one single control, we're going to rely on a range of complementary controls in order to protect the information that a organization that the, a company has. Okay. And people also talk about, you know, or people use cloud solutions. Um, uh, in fact, I think I've seen that in the comments here today. Is it enough to use a cloud solution? Uh, well, uh, I think that with cloud solutions, um, they can be vulnerable to security incidents and security weaknesses as well. And so what organizations need to be cognizant of as they start to leverage different cloud solutions uh, or providers is that um, typically there's a shared responsibility model with uh, cloud solutions or providers, wherein um, the cloud provider has some responsibility for the security of the of the, 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 the solution or environment. And then the, the end user of that solution also bears some responsibility and needs to ensure that there's the appropriate configurations uh, to protect the information. And so both of the, those roles acting in concert is ultimately what ensures the uh, protection of information. If one of those is not there, uh, if there's a weak link in that, in, in, in the, uh, in that shared responsibility model, then that's when uh, there can be an incident or a data breach. Okay, and Nitz, I'm sure a question that everybody's thinking to themselves, uh, and uh, I'll just post you is, you're the CEO of a tech company. I, I work with a tech company, Benevo. How is Benevo solving these issues? Yes, so um, in the last um, year, we've uh, spent significant resources to make sure we build a very strong a model that is using the same principles that um, Ryan just described about layer defense and um, and making sure we are putting enough controls in place and taking the best in-class solutions. Um, and and we come up we came up with a with a five tiers model that is taking really the most innovative approach using technology and ending up resulting um, in a ninety-seven percent reduction in the risk. Um, of a data breach and the impact of a data breach if that happens. So it's a significantly uh, a significant important and those 97% is in comparison to the current solution using used by competitors, by relocate by RMCs, by by anyone else. So it's it's for companies who care about uh, data security and about a uh, about protecting their employees' data. It's obviously not for every company, uh, but it's something that we've added, we've rolled out with our existing clients and, um, and something that has been um, working very well. So we'll share more about that in the corporate event. Unfortunately, I can't do a demo of that here and share more information because it's simply not a, a good a cybersecurity practice to share the, the layers of a, a protection um, to the world. But so that's on, why on the internet, I, I can see where you're coming from. The idea of actually saying, here's our security plan and we're just going to put it out there on the Internet for everybody to every, everybody to see. I mean, I, I, I can understand why that would be shooting ourselves in, 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 in the foot. Uh, but we do have a special session coming up on the 10th of February. And, uh, and Tally has just posted it. Uh, it's a corporate only event on um, as I say, if you go to Benevo.com slash cybersecurity dash intro. Uh, we think it's going to be absolutely fascinating. And tell us a bit more about what we'll be sharing on, on, on that show. I know you can't go into the details, but just tell us a, bit, a little bit more about the sort of ideas or the thoughts that will be shared. Yeah, I think I think the, the, the concepts will be shared. There are, are first the full findings of the survey um, and the benchmark report, as well as sharing a few examples with some of the people we've talked with um, in the last year in the industry about incidents they, they had and how to solve them, how to mitigate them. And we will get a set of tools that each corporate can take at the end of the session and start to implement it. Whether it's with Benevo or without Benevo, that's not the important bit, but they can take, it's going to be actionable 
attempts that they can take and go back to the vendors they work with to make sure um, we as an industry increase um, the level of protection we give to employees. Okay, and I I gather, obviously, I, I get that that webinar is for corporates only, but there will also be a lot of suppliers watching us today on, on the show. What last tips can we give to them in terms of things that they can be doing to enhance their their, their, their security? I think I, I'll, I'll give a first go, then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll pass to Ryan. I think a few good principles to take is looking at what are the best practice available on the market? How can I apply uh, as much of that? Minimize the amount of personal information that we that we hold. Do we really need to know the nationality and the citizenship and the passport number of uh, an employee if we're only doing a home search for them? Is that really is that really necessary? Can we not deliver the service without it? So reduce as much as possible of personal data, reduce the time we hold it, make sure we don't send information just by email um, or, or and we use secure systems. And, and go to an expert, whether it's, um, I know obviously I would recommend to, to engage with Ryan and his team uh, because they have a lot of experience in the mobility space, but there are also other opportunities for you. Go talk to um, to experts. It's worth the the investment. Um, the value that it will bring to the business is significant, and the ability to sleep better at night is also worth that. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Shout out to to Ryan and everybody at Surface Cybersecurity. Uh, great people to to work with. I, I know we do, and we and uh, great 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 company. Now, Nikola uh, Radinovic just. Uh, Put this comment up. 97% is amazing. That's talking about the reduction in cybersecurity risks that we're talking about with our Benevo solution. Data security is the first commandment of any project dealing with personal employee data. And Nitsan, um, just for the last few minutes, how do we get to 97%? I mean, that's a very precise figure. Tell, tell us a little bit about where 97% comes from. Yeah, it's it's actually uh, a bit a bit complicated to to go into the whole details right now, but um, this is from an analysis we did with um, with a corporate who is using uh, uh, one of the RMCs, comparing what level of data is exposed. So how much data and for how long before they started to use Benevo and after they started to use Benevo and kind of seeing how how we've managed to better protect that amount of personal information that can be exposed and the impact and the risk of the exposure. Okay, well, thank you to Nitsan, thank you to Ryan, and also thank you to Tally. Some, some people ask me, how do I manage to get all the comments up so quickly whilst we're, uh, we're doing it? The answer is we have behind the scenes, the one and only Tally. And where are you joining from today, Tally? I'm joining from Bulgaria, cold Bulgaria. Okay, <laughs> so, so from Nitsan, from Ryan, from Tally, uh, Julia has, in fact, left us because she's go about to take a plane to Dubai where she's working. Uh, and Carolyn, uh, who's uh, being pulled around by her kids on, on, on air, I think, has gone back to, uh, to, 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 fam to managing her family and her work duties. So, uh, so goodbye from all of us and from everybody else. And we will be back this time next week. Thank you all. And we'll see you all next week. Take care, everybody. Thank you.